In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is speaking. He's coaching his disciples. He's about to release them really on their, their, their first initiative alone. He's going to pair them up and send them out. And it's a rather lengthy instructional passage, but he says, be on your guard against men. Wow. That's Jesus. They'll hand you over to the local councils and they'll flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. You're going to get put into the system. See, again, there's a, real, there's, a, there's a debate in the church whether or not we should message ourselves in such a way that the system will applaud us. And Jesus is suggesting that if we align ourselves with him, we're going to get pulled into that system. Verse 19, but when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. Then in verse 26, don't be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim it from the roofs. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The, the, the punchline to me is when Jesus said, what I tell you in the dark, speak it in the daylight. What's whispered in your ear, if you'll allow me, good old Southern language, shout it from the rooftops. Folks, we have good news for the world. And Jesus has asked us to shout it from the rooftops. To shout it from the rooftops. Don't let anybody who knows you fail to understand you are an unapologetic, unrelenting advocate for Jesus of Nazareth. Isaiah gives us a presentation. Again, what I want to highlight is the Bible tells us in such plain language, there's going to be this tension between truth and deception. We're shocked by it. We're, we're caught unprepared. It, it's like you get on a plane and you take off and your ears start to pop and you think you're having some sort of a physical failure. Somebody should have told you that's normal. And what I'm suggesting is, is from a biblical perspective, this tension between truth and deception is not only to be expected, it's going to intensify. Which means when you choose God's truth, there's going to be a chorus of people going, you're crazy. Uh -huh. Isaiah 59, justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Now this is written to the covenant people of God. He's not describing some pagan group. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. You can be celebrated if you'll choose ungodliness. You'll make the cover of magazines. You'll be lauded as a breakthrough, as an independent thinker, as a visionary, as courageous. If you take a biblical worldview, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times in those same places, you'll be backwards. Be a little simple-minded, haven't kept up, emotionally underdeveloped, intellectually limited antiquated. Whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and he was displeased because there was no justice. You see, when truth stumbles in the streets and righteousness is not celebrated, justice diminishes. There are loud voices, powerful voices that would tell us today there's more justice absent a biblical worldview. It's a lie. It's unscriptural church. It's another point of deception. The more broadly Jesus is celebrated, the more broadly a biblical worldview is incorporated, embraced, codified, and practiced in our schools, in our universities, in the marketplaces, the more that justice will prevail. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. God's expectation is there would be men and women who would step into the breach. It was appalling to him that no one would do that. I do not intend to be a part of a generation when God looks and he's appalled. Do you? I'm going to climb up on a rooftop looking for a megaphone. If I can't find one, I'm going to roll up a newspaper. I'll shout till I get hoarse. Then we'll go to semaphore. When my arms get tired, we'll tap it out in Morse code. I don't know what we'll do after that. Maybe a signal fire. 
But we have a message for our world. Amen. The solutions we need aren't coming because of another election or another economic trend or the next technological breakthrough. I'm not opposed to any of those things. They could all help. But the source, the origin of the transformation will come from a biblical worldview, from the throne of God. Amen. And the church has to believe that. But it's not a new challenge. It's not the end of the age or the end of the world. It will intensify, but it's a part of what's been playing out in the world since the garden when Satan said to Eve, did God really say? Deception started in the opening chapters of the book. Did God really say you couldn't eat that? Look at Isaiah 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We thought that happened in the 21st century. We thought TikTok created that. <laughs> Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You see, the fundamental collision is spiritual between a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. Amos wrote about it in chapter five. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. Now, with that little background, I want you to spend just a minute. I, I've tried to choose some characters that were familiar to you. And one that we know from the Christmas story predominantly is Joseph. We don't know a great deal about Joseph. We know a very limited window in his life. He steps out of the narrative early. Seems to suggest he died a, a premature death. He wasn't there when Jesus was on the cross. Jesus assigned responsibility to Mary to John. But Joseph was a central, pivotal character in the beginning of the narrative. So I pulled a couple of passages. I think they'll help us understand a little bit of this, this tension between God's truth and deception and what it means to live that forward. Spoiler alert, we've got to stop collecting truth if it's some, as if it's something that's theoretical. We've collected biblical facts like we are building hard drives for the kingdom of God. God knows the names of the 12 tribes. And while I think it's worthwhile to study and learn, I've spent most of my life doing that, I'm far more interested in giving expression to the truth of God than just assimilating it. I want to live like it's true. Now, we struggle that within every area of our life. It isn't just our spiritual lives, our physical health. We probably know better than we do. We'll talk about that another time. Matthew chapter one. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Matthew writes that like it makes sense to us. Oh, of course I understand that. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. He didn't want to add to the humiliation that was going to be involved. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he'll save his people from their sins. Now, that's where the angelic message ends. That's where the quotation marks are, closed quotes. The next verse, Matthew inserts, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Joseph knew the prophecy? Really? How many do you know about what's going to happen? We attribute to Joseph a better knowledge of the scripture and yet the scripture was written on scrolls that were maintained in the synagogues and private individuals or homes or families didn't have copies. I happen to know that Nazareth, where Joseph lived, did not have Wi-Fi. <laughs> I know that seems terribly unfair. He was educationally disadvantaged, but God recruited him. I don't know if he did or didn't. The next sentence is remarkable. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. Let me suggest that truth broke into Joseph's awareness in the middle of that night. 
He had a set of circumstances. He's engaged. There was a legally binding commitment to it at that point in time. The woman to who he's engaged is pregnant, and he knows it isn't his child. So he's considering his options on how he's going to resolve this problem. It's embarrassing, it's disappointing, it's maybe even heartbreaking. The very best, it's awkward, and he has a dream, and he sees an angel. Now, if you'll allow me, it's it's something of a, it's a perspective, but at that point, truth broke into Joseph's awareness because the angel brought something to him that he was not expecting. Don't be afraid to marry Mary. And that is the real core of the problem. I don't want to marry Mary. Because in her current condition, marrying Mary doesn't make me marry. (laughs) That wasn't the bargain we struck. It's not the nature of the covenant. And the angel's message is don't be afraid to marry Mary. Now that's a big chunk of truth to have to process. And as if that were not enough, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'd like to get my hands on him. (laughs) And Mary's going to have a son who will save his people from their sins. Now, Here's the part that is, is beyond me. To be just real candid, Joseph's in a place I'm not. Why fire? No. Joseph did what the angel had commanded him. He didn't go on a three-week fast. He didn't go find a rabbi. He was confronted with God's truth. Everything that angel said to him about Mary was true. All the things that the angel said to him about Mary actually had been stated by the prophets as if that makes it easier to process in real time. We know a lot of things God has said about the end of the age, but in real time, it's hard to process. And Joseph processed it and said, okay, I'm in, let's go. See, I'm suggesting a little different attitude towards God's truth. What I find in my own heart, and I suspect it might exist in yours, is this temptation to want to stand apart from it And to review it as if we're Olympic judges or quality control experts or some sort of a position that we're a little bit above it, not as if we are subjected to it. That when we see the truth, our response is to say yes. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill. Hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.